Hi everyone, it's Kirk and Michael for this week's edition of The Rundown. Probably the most excited Michael and I have ever been for a rundown. I would argue, maybe, well, okay, most important to understand what drives the P word? Performance <laughs> in our planning. The P word, they thought I was saying planning. What drives performance in our planning? We're gonna finally teach you how it works. Maybe explain a little bit why we've tried to stay away from talking about this, but we are gonna tackle this topic. And um, I know Michael, you have some thoughts before we start. Yeah, so one of the reasons we tend to avoid performance is because it's a really nuanced conversation and it's very different than what people are used to thinking of when it comes to performance. And Kirk and I were joking earlier, uh, before recording this that people, when they're coming to the classes, people come to the class, we were calling it performance zombies because the industry has done a great job, unfortunately, of brainwashing people into thinking that performance is all that matters. Performance, 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 that's what drives success or failure. And while they're driving that message to people, they're selling them stuff, strategies, mutual funds. They have a better way to get more picking, performance. market timing. And, and so people fall for it, hook, line, and sinker, because they're chasing this magical performance that they've been brainwashed to believe in. And to be fair, Michael, let's be clear. When we're younger, it really is performance. And it is really is simple as buying the index and yes. nothing beats it. So where it gets more nuanced, Michael, is around as we approach and enter into through retirement. Mm -hmm. Performance is driven by a lot of different levers. And I think everyone understands that, that it, at least our clients understands performance is driven by more than just the average returns. It's about income planning and everything, tax planning and everything the else. The average calendar year returns. We're gonna talk about why yes. the calendar year breaks don't matter. Yes. It's the long run. Yes, so, so Michael, Let's talk about why we're gonna tackle this today. And honestly, Michael and I, we've been working on this. Michael spent m more time, a <laughs> lot more time working on this. We've been talking about this together for a while. But the reason we're gonna tackle it right now isn't an accident, right, Michael? Because we saw for about 16, 18 months there, 2022 and after, a lot of the questions, you all know that for in our private practice, I'm reading every review questionnaire that comes through our office. Every one of yours I'm looking at. And I'm looking at uh, review notes with the advisors meeting with you to see what's going on. I like and I need to know and want to know, have a pulse on the feeling in the room. What are people concerned about, thinking about, worrying about, wanting to hear about? That's how we come up with our content and topics for the rundown, mm -hmm. for our radio shows. So for a while there, everyone was, I think, a little nervous. They weren't saying it, but they were a little nervous around. We had a really bad 2022. And how is it that you can give me six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates? And everyone else says I can only have three or four percent. So we focused the last 12, 18 months, yeah, yeah. 12 to 18 months trying to help you better understand how we're able to drive those higher income streams at six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates differently than conventional wisdom like everyone else forces three or four percent. Mm -hmm. Now we're hearing a little more questions around, hey, performance. And to be fair, we sort of neglected the 30, 40, maybe 50 percent of our clients that really is just focused on their primary focus is legacy. They have plenty of wealth. They just want to leave as much wealth as possible to their children as long as they can maintain their lifestyle. So legacy is important for them. We sort of ignored them for the last year or so. And, a little bit in and terms those of our people, uh, Those people were saying, you know, I'm only spending 3 or 4%, not because I'm afraid to spend more, but because right. I, I don't want any more, and legacy is a priority for me. Yeah, Michael, 3% of $20 million is a little a different great story. Yeah. It's different, right? So go ahead. And so for those people, they were saying, you know, you and Kirk keep talking about the plans that have five, six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates, and that's all well and good, but are, do these things apply to my plan? I'm only spending three or four percent because I don't want any more, and, and legacy is important to me. Do, do these things apply to my plan or not? And they do, but just in a different in a different way. Right, Michael. The same concept. It's all around sequence of returns. Mm -hmm. 
It's all about when do I take income from which accounts during what market conditions. It is all around that, and we're gonna teach that today. Because that's what drives performance, it drives our ability to take a higher withdrawal rates, plus some risk mitigation tools, the levers. We're gonna teach that driving performance. But Michael, I know you wanted to refresh on. So I wanted to do a quick refresh on sequence of returns risk, just to make sure I'm not losing anybody here. Uh, a really simple chart to start off with. I'll pick the middle bar. So this just shows us if we suffer a loss, how much gain do we need to get back to break even? The following year. Yep. So the middle bar, 30%. If we lose 30%, we need a 43% recovery to, to get back to break even. If we lose 40%, we need a 67% recovery to get back to break even. Well, this chart's from the class, right, Michael? Mm -hmm. We talk about it. I think in the class I use the example, if if you invested a million dollars into a mutual fund that lost 50% the first year, how much would you have? And the answer would be 500,000. And then I would say to you, the next year, if you gained 50%, how much would you have? And people would say $750,000. And then I would tell you, but yes, that's great. You lost 25% of your money, but you have an average rate of return of zero. You lost 50 the first year, gained 50 the second. That is an average rate of return of zero. And we call this mutual fund math, right? Yes. We joke about it in the class. Because mutual funds will use that math to go promote their funds, and they're, they're promoting the average returns, not the real returns. Right. And again, we're trying to explain to people that when you're pulling money out, especially when you're pulling the money out, the average returns are not what drives this. The real returns are what drive this. Right. That's the sequence of returns risk. So, Michael, then let's jump into it, because we're going to give an example where Everything is static. No one's taking money out of a portfolio. No one's putting money in the portfolio. We're simply going to take a million dollars. Do you want me to be A or B? I don't um, care. I'll be account A because you're okay. always account A in the class. Okay, and I'm so, always account B. So account A, that is me. My portfolio, Michael and I are going to have a competition and we both chose, decided we're going to take a million dollars. We're going to stick it in this investment in, in our own individual investments and let's see who has more money 20 years later. You stole account A from me, but that's okay. I did? Yeah. I did it again. You did it again. <laughs> well, I could analyze so this. So you, <laughs> you can be account A, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so you're account A. We both start with a million bucks. Yep. We have flipped sequence of returns, but we're yes. not putting money in or taking money out. The end result is we have the exact same number at the end. Yeah, it didn't matter. You saw I gained early, you lost early, didn't make a difference. We both had a t over 10% average rate of return, and we both ended up with $5.1 million. So very simple concept. When you're not putting money in or taking money out, the sequence of the returns does not matter. The average return is what drives the outcome. Now the next situation, same numbers. We both start with a million bucks. We have the same returns, just flip the sequence, but now we're taking out $50,000 per year, increasing by 3% per year. And Kirk's going to be account A because he stole it from me, <laughs> which is okay. He signs my paycheck, so I guess he can be account A. So Kirk's account A, I'm account B. Same exercise, but now Kirk, after 20 years, has $2.8, $2.9 million when he's 20 years in. And I run out of money by year 17, year 18. Yes. So Again, same numbers, flip the sequence because I had this negative two years, my first two years were negative, that first year was pretty nasty, and I couldn't recover. Well, you say it was nasty, but that, I mean, that's a 60-40 portfolio in 2008. That's fair, 60-40 fell more than that in 2008. That's yeah. fair, that's fair. So it's nasty, but it was a 60-40 portfolio. Nasty, but that, that's an average drawdown. That's, exactly, so, so, so what, what we showed there, and, and everyone, most of the people watching this probably already know this, right, is that we're showing Two people having the same average 10%, over 10% rate of return. They're both taking out 5% a year, but one has $2.8 million 20 years later. The other one ran out of money in 17 years. It's, everything is driven by, based upon the sequence of the returns will drive your performance. And to your point, the people who have been through the class and our clients have seen these charts probably 10 times now and they're saying, we get it enough. So let's, yes. let's move on to the next one. Then the next one is how we tackle this in our planning. Yes, please, everyone stick around. I know we're reviewing a few charts here, but in a few minutes, we're gonna, get, we're gonna blow you away. We're gonna show you how we do it, and we're gonna show you 
the math, the impact, the difference of doing it right versus wrong. So right. Ahead. So this is, and people again have seen this before, but just to refresh on this one last chart to refresh with, the, the buckets within buckets, the red zone, yellow zone, green zone inside of the bucket three. Bucket three in plans is the fidelity accounts, the market-based accounts, individual stocks, bonds, and ETFs, no mutual funds. If you're still thinking mutual funds, go to the class. You'll learn why you shouldn't be. So this is inside of bucket three, the different buckets within buckets, if you will, the different zones inside the fidelity accounts. In this case, red zones, yellow zones, green zones. The red zones are the safest we possibly can be. Very low risk, very low return. Yellow zones have a bit more risk, a bit more volatility. Green zones are stock market-based accounts. Full volatility, full growth. Yes. Now the point of illustrating this is to remind people, we are sending income to people who are retired from the red zone. That's right. You're only getting income from the safe red zones, not from yellow and green zones that are fluctuating with the stock market. So I'm gonna restate what you said. Think of this as if you are retired, which many of you are, and all the money you're getting is coming out of our red zones, never from the yellow and the green zones. Now what we're gonna show you, I'm gonna give it away a little bit, but we're gonna show it to you is when do I refill the red zone bucket or refill the yellow zone bucket from the green zone? When do I rebalance? And that is, that is the secret, is strategically rebalancing at the right times. Because what most firms run into is they pick a strategy, 60-40, 70-30, 50-50, whatever they pick, and they rebalance automatically, monthly, quarterly, yeah. annually, whenever, based on their cookie cutter system. Michael, they have a one account. With one account, so it's one big yellow zone. There's not a red, yellow, green zone. You got it's one it. big account. And they're sending the 4% every single year out of that one account, and automatically they are rebalancing that account whenever they need it. Mm -hmm. Not whenever they need it, they're just rebalancing. It's automatic. On it's a monthly, quarterly, annual basis. You got it. And you know what's funny is the more often they rebalance, the more they promote. Look how look what we're doing for you. We're, we're rebalancing. That's exactly. They're just they're pushing a button. Yes. It's it's a it's one cookie cutter portfolio that every, all their clients are in, and they push one button to rebalance all the accounts. Yes. So M Michael, I know. So we're gonna we're gonna show them how we do it different and what's the the triggers, but show the portfolio growth with no withdrawals of our three buckets. All right, so this next chart, it is a, re it's a, it's a very simple line, three lines in the chart, very simple line chart. We have from 2000 through 2023, three indexes. So we've got, again, red, yellow, green buckets. So the red zone is a 100% bond index. Good. It has the lowest growth. Lowest volatility, lowest growth, that's not surprising. Between 2000 through 2023, it went from $1 million to approximately, I'm rounding here, 2.5 million. The yellow zone bucket, a 60-40 stock bond uh, index, is uh, the middle line here, went from approximately, went from 1 million to approximately 4.3 million, I'm rounding again here-ish. The green zone, a full S&P 500 index, all stocks, yep. started at a million dollars, has, you can see the most volatility, the lowest lows, the highest highs, and finishes with about 5.2 million. So this is not surprising. The more stock risk you have, the more volatility, the more variation there is, and over time, the more growth you're gonna have. Not surprising. We're not taking any money out of these indexes. Yeah, but why don't we do the next one where I think we're taking $40,000 a year out, which is, the industry's rule, isn't it? And that is the key. So that, that first chart, there is no income being taken out. Yep. Very straightforward and easy. Now we're gonna take income out of the indexes over time. Yep. So this next chart, same concept. We have the red, yellow, green zones. Yep. We're starting with a million dollars in 2000, but now we're taking out $40,000 per year. To live on, right? I mean, this is just on. the 4% rule. It's the 4% rule. And we're gonna use the 4% rule for these next couple exercises intentionally. Yep. We're trying to speak the same language as the industry to just compare apples to apples here. Yes. So we're only taking out 4%. So for this person with, well, I'll start in the, in the reverse order here. For the, the green zone, all stocks, they're taking out 4% per year. It gets really dicey around 2008, 2009. 
but it does work and they recover and they end up with approximately $1.4 million by 2023. The yellow zone, the 60-40 portfolio, the middle line here, they end up with about 1.6 million and the red zone, the, the bond index, that has the smoothest ride but ultimately has the lowest growth, ends up with 1.1 million-ish. So a couple things I want to point out, Michael. So <clears throat> going through this, this helps, hopefully helps people to understand why they use the 4% rule. Mm -hmm. It also helps to understand why they say it's a collaboration, whatever your risk tolerance is, because it doesn't matter if you were 50-50, 40-60, 60-40, 70-30, all of them would have worked. They would have not ran out of money if they take the 4% rule. That's why they created the 4% rule. It gives you the ability to say and do whatever you want with your advisors, and they can sell whatever it is you, that, that, that you think you want, and they still can make sure you don't outlive your money, and there's no work involved. There's nothing here. And that's what just grinds my gears whenever I see the commercials now from any of the asset managers and they're talking about, you know, come talk to us and we'll collaborate to find your personal risk tolerance. And it, it just is so f infuriating because they're going to let you pick whatever you want. If you're nervous about the election this year, they're going to agree with you and say, you're right to be nervous. Let's pull back your risk. If you're bullish about the election this year, they're going to tell you, I agree with you. Let's get more aggressive. They're just going to be yes men or yes women. Whatever you want them to do, they're going to do for you. Because, because, it, because it won't fail if they're only taking 3 or 4%. Because they know that you yeah. can pick whatever you want as long as you're only taking 4% per year. Or less. Or yes. less. Yep. Because it won't fail. Right. That's, that's the whole point. They can be your friend. They can whatever you want. They agree with. There's, there's no direction at all. They're just telling you what you want to hear. So what we're going to show is now what, we're, what we do. But I think it's important that, that I think that that message around that whole, the, the whole collaboration discussion and based upon your risk tolerance. It's, it's not based upon your feelings, our feelings, or anyone's feelings or predictions. It's irrelevant in our practice, in our firm for our clients, as you know. It's based on what do you have, what do you want, and what does the plan tell us is the best way to get the there. The plan dictates everything. There's no biases, there's no philosophies or theories that we are going to follow from an investment perspective that drives what we invest in. The plan tells us what we invest in. The theories and strategies come in to where we take the income from and when. This is what drives performance and allows us to take the six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates. In before we jump off this chart here, yes. speaking of six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates. Oh, the plan blows up. If this, if we adjust this chart to take six percent instead of four percent, you're right. This green zone index blows up. Yellow zone index. Sixty forty runs out of money. Blows up. You couldn't do our philosophy. That's when we say you. We gave you a flying card. You couldn't have your six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates used in our in the industry today. It doesn't exist because it blows up right there. Sorry. I'm animated, it blows up. That's why they won't let you do it. They're unwilling to take the enormous lift in energy and work to do it the way we're gonna teach you. And so let's, talk, let's jump onto the next chart here because this is where people are really gonna be surprised, I think. So this next chart is a traditional 60-40 portfolio versus how we would manage a dynamic income plan 60-40 portfolio. So a couple of things here before I jump in too deep. They're both 60-40 portfolios to start, yep. and we're just using 60% S&P, 40% U.S. bond index. There's no sexy, sizzly stuff going on Perfect. underneath here. Just very the indexes. Very basic stuff. So what's happening here is the growth of the portfolios as we are withdrawing. Again, we're sticking to the 4% rule in this case just to paint the picture. Yep. Go ahead. So we're withdrawing 40000 bucks per year from the portfolios that both started a million dollars. For the first eight or nine years, they're relatively similar. Yeah, hold on, back up. Let's make sure they understand. What we are going to do using our philosophy is we are going to take out of, and see, I have to label them because I'm colorblind. <laughs> we are taking income, all of, all of your income from the red zone, okay? And, it, and, and you don't see any difference over the early years as you're stating. Mm-hmm. 
explain why. I just want to make sure they understand we are only withdrawing money out of the red zone. So in these first two, three, four, five years, we're burning money out of the red zone. We're yes. sending income to people from the red zone and not pulling income out of the green zone, yellow or green zones, out of the stocks. Yes. Because in this situation, in this example, from 2000 to 2003, the stock market's down, down, down. So we are not refilling that red zone in those first no three years. No rebalancing. That's the key. We are not rebalancing. We are not refilling our red zone when the markets are down. Because doing that would require to sell the green zone dollars, sell the stock market when it's down. It would that's, trigger the sequence of returns risk. That's locking risk. in sequence of returns risk. That's it. the opposite of what we're trying to do here. So that red zone, as we're burning through it, sending income to a retiree, the red zone is buying time for the stock market to recover and grow so that we can rebalance, replenish that red zone when it makes sense to. Not right. on a monthly basis, not on a quarterly basis, not on an annual basis, but when it makes sense. Exactly. And the end result is what, Michael? And so the end result, so this, the horsepower really kicks in, you can see on this chart, the horsepower really kicks in around 2012, 2013, because we didn't sell when the stock market was down. We burned through the red zone. We, the red zone gave the stocks time to recover. And now there are more stocks in the portfolio still when the stock market finally gets past the 2000 recession, the 2008 crash, and now we have the really good stock market from 2009 on, and that's when the fact that we didn't sell the stocks in 2000 or 2008 really start to shine. So what's the end result, Michael? That's so, what they want. You're trying to tell them the clock is built. Go ahead. What's so the end result? end result. So the traditional 60-40 ends up with approximately 1.6 million yep. over 23 years. The dynamic income planning, how we would manage over throughout that time, ends up with approximately $2.3 million. So it's approximately well, a $700,000 difference. And we're not <clears throat> timing anything. No, we're, we're not, not changing anything. investments. And while this is a hypothetical example, you and I know, because we've had how many discussions around illustrating this, that our results would even be better than this because we wouldn't be using an index bond. We wouldn't be. We would be laddering munis or laddering corporates or laddering treasuries and we would be managing duration risk, we would even do an extra layer of risk mitigation than just a 40% bond index. And really, and we can't illustrate this, That would, maybe we could, it'd be really difficult to illustrate how bucket two plays into this. Yes. Because a common question that we get, which is a great question, is, well, wait a minute, wait, what bu happens? Define bucket two. So it's our, 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 our um, pivot accounts, the insured accounts. Bucket two, the, the pivot accounts, the insured accounts that are not tied to the stock or the bond market. Right. And so a great question that we get occasionally is, well, what happens if we burn through all the red zone money and the stock market's still down? Perfect. Because we have examples like 2000 and 2007, 2008, where it took the market five years to recover. Yes. And so what if we burn through all the red zone money and the market still hasn't recovered? Great question. Then we can pivot to the bucket two and turn on the one by fives, the five by fives, the hybrid social security, turn on one of these accounts that are not tied to the stock market. Again, and the whole reason we're, we're going to pivot to those accounts is to give the, make sure I got the colors right, green zone and yellow zone more time to recover if we have an extended period of time where, the, where we haven't recovered yet. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to pull money out of that, that green zone. I keep looking at it. <laughs> the, we're not going to pull money out of that green zone until it recovers, it gets closer. And that's why we have the pivot accounts. That's how we're really, I mean, compliance didn't want us, I mean, we, we had to use this as an example for a lot of reasons. The performance is actually even better. <laughs> And that is for the people who say, okay, well, I hear you on the six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates, but again, I don't want to spend six, seven, eight. I'm only spending four percent. I did a great job saving, I have a large nest egg, I only want four percent, and legacy is important. And they're looking at their annual calendar year returns and comparing to a 60 40 benchmark. That's not the right comparison because we're replenishing red zone buckets differently than a monthly, quarterly, or annual rebalance over the long run, you're not selling the stocks when they're down ever, and that's driving the returns. Yes. The real returns, not average returns. You got it. So that's why those, and I think you said this, the calendar returns, stop looking at your plan over a calendar year. It, 
because you can't just take a snapshot of it because our risk mitigation, our dynamic, what do we call it? Dynamic income planning um, hasn't even been applicable yet in your plan. Mm -hmm. So if someone just retired in 2020, beginning of 2023, they haven't even, nothing really bad has happened. But if you retired in 21 or 22, then you'll see the difference. Well, so for that 2022 person, if someone retired in 2022, which is unlucky timing, but with a plan, they're fine. They're going to see, wait a minute, I'm, I'm behind schedule already. And we weren't concerned because their green zone's behind schedule, but yes. their green zone has time to recover because they have the red zone and they have the pivot accounts. You got so it. it wasn't a concern. You got it. So actually, I think we accomplished a couple of things, really. I mean, the goal here was really to talk about what's driving the performance for our, our in our private practice, the people that don't have a max income plan, because we've been, I think, neglecting them, given the feedback we've been getting recently. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're driving performance, but it's also how we're able to take that six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates. It works both ways. So again, one thing that I want to point out here, we have had, we get this question, why don't other people try to replicate what you're doing? Yeah. Michael, people, you, we know, we, many people have tried to replicate what we're doing and they can't. And they can't for a number of reasons. One is what they will try to do is they'll create one philosophy, one strategy, one portfolio, try to automate it and make sure all the clients fit into that box. So it doesn't matter if you have more IRA saved or less IRA saved or more raw saved or all the different age gap differences, all of those variables, throw them out the window, everyone fits in this box, and we can try to recreate this system. It doesn't come close, and that's why they don't do it. The second reason is they're not disciplined. They don't choose the, the people that will let, they, they avoid the collaborations, or we avoid the collaborations, they encourage the collaborations, and you can't do both. You can't do this nuanced planning for each individual client in each individual plan and also give that customer service of a family office. It doesn't, it just can't happen. It just can't work. And a good example is I had Without a couple excessive people. Without fees. I mean, they, they would have to pay a lot more. Yeah, fees. a good example is I had a couple people come to see us in October 2022, which in hindsight was the trough of that bear market, the bottom of the bear market. And they said, Michael, look, my red zone's holding up pretty well. My green zone's getting clobbered and I don't like the president, and I think we're gonna lose 20 more percent, so get me out of the green zone. Get, pull the ripcord, get me out now. I nope. told them, no, we're not doing that. And then fast forward till today, they're thrilled that we kept them disciplined. And they said, well, how did you know that the market was gonna recover from October 2022? And I told them, I didn't know. But what I did know is that you have your red zone, you have your pivot accounts, so we're not gonna be reactive. I can't let your fears or anxiety impact your plan because I know your plan's going to work. Period. And we know over any extended period of time, the market's gonna go up. And also the flip side is gonna be true also. Post the election, yes. I know we're gonna get someone saying, the person I like won, so I want more green zone money. We're gonna tell them the same thing. No, we're not doing it. We've got to balance. Each zone plays its role. Let the plan do its job. And the plan drives everything. The plan drives it. Not opinions, feelings, not our opinions or feelings, the plan. Exactly. So uh, hopefully this was helpful. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We were excited. I hope it turned out as well as we were hoping. And it's under 30 minutes, although we're not going to do homework or they say, so we can't really take a victory lap on the time. We're just cutting out sections to fit our 30 minute goal here, but I'll take that for now. Good. See you next time. Take care.